Um, we come to the final talk, although not the final session, of the conference, and we thought we'd end with thinking big, and few people in Oxford think bigger than our next speaker. Uh, David Deutsch is uh, the founder and guru of the field that's now known as uh, quantum computing. He's responsible for dreaming up the qubit and much else besides, uh, and we've asked him to speak to us today about his latest research. David, over to you. Hi. Um, so, can you all hear me? Um, I'll take that as a yes. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk a bit about some new research I'm doing on um, constructor theory, um, which does have uh, rather large um, potential coverage, but it's very nascent and early yet. So, but I was encouraged to um, talk to you about it. So, um, in many cultures all over the world, there was an ancient myth of a cornucopia, a supernatural device producing an endless stream of food. It was a quintessential wish fulfillment fantasy of people who faced the unique primal dilemma of our species between toil, meaning unpleasant physical work, and starvation. There were many other wish fulfillment fantasies, such as flying, uh, space travel, <laughs> transmutation of elements, immortality. People tried to achieve those from time to time, but strangely, nobody ever tried to make a cornucopia, unless you count the agricultural re revolution, perhaps 12,000 years ago, that increased food security, though it may have increased toil as well, until the scientific revolution definitively provided an exponentially increasing amount of food and drastically decreased toil. So much so that in high knowledge economies, the primal dilemma has now been eliminated. As a result of such success, wish fulfillment fantasies have become a lot more ambitious as, we, as we've heard at this meeting. Yet, the idea of achieving universality in making things, eliminating all toil through technology, was remarkably slow to take hold. Even the golem, a fantasy of medieval Jewish mystics, its universality was not recognized. There was only ever one golem and one cornucopia. Until 20th century science fiction, when Karel Chapek introduced the term robot, which means toil. Ever since, science fiction has imagined technological cornucopias, sometimes called universal constructors, which, would be, which I'm going to talk about, which would be capable of producing an endless stream of not just food, but any physical objects that the user asked for, without any need for any toil. In 1933, the science fiction writer Lawrence Manning envisaged what he called a production device working by transmutation and nuclear power. He described the characters in his story feeding the device by shoveling earth and gravel into hoppers. But shoveling is toil. So is mining nuclear fuel. So a universal constructor in the sense of a toil eliminator must be able to mine its own raw materials, dispose of its own waste, exploit sources of energy for itself, perform maintenance on itself. It must also be programmable because there are exponentially many possible things one could want. The recipes for building all of them can't be pre-encoded in a simple object, in a single object. In general, a universal constructor would operate by being programmed to make, as the sci-fi authors David Gerald and Larry Niven put it, the tools to make the tools to make the tools and so on. And these programs could not be written 
unless the knowledge of how to do all that had first been created. That is irreducibly a task for creative beings, people, not obedient automata. Knowledge is the only thing that no mere constructor can reliably provide. Now, I'd lo love to prove that a universal constructor, in that sense, can be made. Why would I want to do that? Turing didn't. His universal computer made of paper tape required a processor embodying very complicated rules in its physical structure that could run indefinitely without maintenance with an unlimited supply of paper and pencils, so generally with a lot of toil from its operators that is not included in the theory. Nor did my theory of the universal quantum computer prove that it can be built. And to this day, there are people who think it can't. Nor did John von Neumann, whose replicator vehicle construction solved the logic of all living things, prove that living things can be made. We know that they can evolve, but it's not self-evident that everything that can evolve can be made reliably along with the tools to make it and so on by a universal machine that can be programmed to build tools to arbitrary depths and maintain itself and find raw materials and energy and so on. That's a measure of why we're still quite a way from building an artificial self-reproducing automaton, a von Neumann machine. For all that those fundamental theories know, the physical universe could be like a basic Lego set. You can build small models, of almost anything, but they're not scalable. In such a universe, there'd be no universal computers, no universal constructor, and presumably no life. Why can't these theories prove from the laws of physics that their respective universal machines can exist? The basic reason is that existing laws of physics are very poorly adapted to proving that something with given properties can be caused to exist without presenting a specific design that was testable. And that is because in the prevailing conception of fundamental physics, there are laws of motion, there are laws setting initial conditions, and between them, those determine everything that happens. So in that conception, there's no such thing as what could happen. Everything either happens or never happens. No such things as counterfactuals, in other words. Yet any universal device is necessarily judged by its counterfactual properties. You don't buy a computer to do only the computations you will use it for. You buy it because it could do any computable computation an enormously larger set. So constructor theory postulates, instead of this conception of initial conditions and laws of motion, that all laws of physics can be expressed in terms of a great dichotomy between transformations that can be caused to happen and those that cannot. From that, we may hope to derive the traditional laws of motion but not initial conditions, not exact initial conditions. The Big Bang can't be caused to happen. Hence, according to constructor theory, there can be no fundamental theory of exact initial conditions. Don't be shocked. E even in the existing conception, there's no fundamental theory of the state in the distant future, even though the laws of motion are time reversal invariant. And it's basically for the same reason, knowledge. The future is affected by knowledge that we don't have yet. And the past, well, the same is true. You can't retrodict historical events in fine detail because the relevant knowledge has been lost. In contrast, there could be a law of constructor theory that, for example, a universal computer is possible. So on one side of the dichotomy. 
which also tells you that the constructor that builds it is possible and the constructor that builds that and so on back to the Big Bang without specifying the exact state, even in principle. This also illustrates that constructor theory doesn't distinguish between microscopic and macroscopic objects or laws because entities in constructor theory are defined by their in-out possibilities and impossibilities, not by how they are constituted microscopically. Unlike their analogues for computation and life that I've mentioned, universal constructors are not built out of elementary construction primitives analogous to bits, qubits, and replicators. Universality for constructors is therefore radically different from that of computers. As I said, I've been working on a proof that a universal constructor is possible from the principles of constructor theory. For example, those principles imply that only finitely many objects that could be needed in constructions can, kinds of objects, that is, that could be needed in constructions, can possibly form spontaneously, i.e. without knowledge. My proof is still quite inchoate, but it's basically that everything complex either evolves, in which case it can be made given the right knowledge, which we might not have, or can be made by a constructor, which can itself be made and so on to a chain of finite depth using knowledge that can itself be created. Knowledge is central to the story. I define knowledge now nowadays as information with causal power. And I define a universal constructor as a macroscopic device capable of causing any physical transformation or delivering any physical object that any other device could under the same circumstances while requiring no input from the user except knowledge. The terms device and knowledge are necessarily macroscopic. And another difference is that a universal constructor is an open system in its functionality, not just in an unphysical approximation like a computer where we ignore its need for maintenance and so on. So a universal constructor will not be a nanoscale 3D printer scanner like the Star Trek replicator, nor like Eric Drexler's grey goo, a term he hates, with elementary programmable nanorobots, unless it makes the goo for a specific non-universal nano purpose, and they'd be controlled by macroscopic computers. Nor will it be a von Neumann machine artificial life, unless it is programmed to be one for a specific purpose, such as covering the moon or Mars with cities and factories. Then the fact that it can build two, four, eight, two to the n instances of itself. Oops, this thing going on with it. Uh, are you all still there? Yep. Yeah, we're yeah. still here. Okay, right. Um, uh, the fact that it can, it can build countless instances of itself will make any parallelizable job completable in essentially linear time. Quite different from the polynomial equivalence classes of computational complexity theory. But those machines won't be nanotechnology, so they won't mutate and decide to take over or infest the world, because they'll have error-correcting hardware that can correct errors reliably until the universe ends. So they will be obedient. They wouldn't be universal if they weren't. And they won't have AGIs, artificial general intelligences, in them, unless someone programs them with one. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, if you had a universal constructor, it couldn't just whip you up a constellation of millions of low Earth orbit spaceships because it would have to pay for the raw materials and the orbit allocations and so on because the use of those resources will still be regulated by an economy, even on Mars. 
So how would the universal constructor pay for those resources with the knowledge that you would give it? Not through toil, but through creative thought. We have to recognize the crucial distinction between knowledge creation and all other information processing, corresponding to the difference between AI and AGI. Only then can we formulate proper laws for regulating advanced information processing, laws that enhance progress rather than strangling it. All existing proposals I've seen do the latter because they compulsively confuse AI with AGI, which are almost opposites, and information with knowledge. The key consideration is that an AGI has full human rights. Neither you nor it is entitled to build another AGI and build it into a von Neumann machine and put millions of them to work. That is slavery. If a human builds an AGI, or if an AGI builds another AGI, they are as responsible for it as a parent is for a child. They have the responsibility in particular to provide it with the resources necessary to become a functional and free member of an open society. Thank you.